Hi everyone, I'm Jody Barrows with The Square and a Square. Welcome to our four o'clock story time. We have been reading the Thread series. There's three books in it so far. The first one is Threads of Change, the next one's Threads of Hope, and the one that we are reading in is the third one, Threads of Courage. It's about a, uh, a group of women that we call the Maley Women, and it starts out in the 1860s. Um, 1856 is the first book, and Courage, we have moved up to 1860. So we are pre-Civil War and Civil War time. And I think you will really enjoy the family of women for those of you who are new to it. You can also go to squareinasquare.com to our website if you'd like to purchase the books. And if you are an e-reader, just go to your favorite place where you purchase your e-readers and look for the threads of home, change, and courage, or by author name, Jody Barrows. The quilt behind me is called Grizzly Mountain, and it is the one that's on the cover of um, the novel that we are reading, the third one. We're going to start right in on chapter 21 on page 146. I miss Luke, Maddie suddenly stated as she sat with a pencil in her hand. The page below her hand had numbers all written in rows exactly like her mother's ledger book. We get letters on the stagecoach for people here. Why can't the letters that Luke has just go on a stagecoach? Liz stopped writing in her own ledger book. The sales at her mercantile continually continued to grow daily. Wagon train loads of people pushing west and the trail di drivers of dusty cattle heading north were now a weekly occurrence. Fort Worth and all it had to offer, good or bad, was a draw for the weary traveler. Fort Worth was gaining popularity as being the place where the west began. She missed her own son and sighed. I know, sweetheart. Me too. I wish we had a way to hear from him, and now that he has made it safely to the Horseshoe Creek Station. Where is that? Maddie asked. Is it on the big map you have? Maddie stood and went to her mother's side. They both looked at the large map of the United States that Liz had nailed to the wall. Mostly her freight wagons, roads, and depot stops were marked, though she had... though she had added the stage line trails and lastly her post office stations. I have been waiting for a government letter to tell me where and when to add the Pony Express mail stations, but I haven't received one. Congress can't seem to agree on adding them as a government contact. Maddie looked at her mother trying to understand her words. Liz realized Maddie didn't understand, so she made another attempt to explain. The men who make our laws and rules and bills at our capital have to do some more work. Okay, Maddie replied quickly. If they are behind, they have to work faster then. Yes, Liz sighed again and slowly nodded her head. From what I can tell, Horseshoe Creek is almost straight north from us. She picked up Maddie and stood her on a bench so she could see the map better. Liz placed her finger on the map where they were and ran her finger up and over to where she thought Luke was. It's a long way, Maddie drug, dragged the words out as she looked at the location where her mother was, where her brother was hoped to be. Has he made it? He should have made it just in time. Liz helped Maddie back down to the floor. In fact, I'm hoping, she paused, that every time the stage comes in that we have a newspaper with a report on the Pony Express's work. Do you think he has any stories of his own about snakes or coyotes? Maddie's eyes grew wide as she leaned forward with her arms outstretched. She was thinking about her own stories and sharing them with her brother. Oh, I'm sure he does. Maybe even an outlaw or an Indian one, too, Liz teased Maddie, but hoped in the back of her mind that his trip was boring with no stories of his own to tell. But she knew better in her heart. She prayed every day for the safety and return of her oldest child. I hope you remember to pray for Luke. I'm positive that he appreciates your thinking of him. Do you think he has some new friends at the station? Maddie looked quizzical at her mother, who was standing close by. Yes, why do you ask? Liz wrinkled, her brow tilting her head, amazed at how her little girl thought about matters in such details. I think Chet is real sad and doesn't have any new friends since Luke left. I don't want Luke to be sad like Chet. Maddie's lip puckered out a little. 
Sweetheart, why do you think Chet is sad? Liz, Liz's mind was now a million miles from her work in her ledger book. She had been figuring how much extra to buy of various supplies. Some of her inventory had been hard, if not nearly impossible to get, with the rumblings of war. Trying to get equivalents to stock was time-consuming and costly. She also wanted a good backstock if her supply chain shut down completely. At least the daily goods were stocked on her shelves and in her storage areas. I heard him in the barn with his horse. I was in the loft with the new kittens. Maddie had Liz's full attention. She silently nodded to encourage her to continue with her story. I thought he was crying. I never saw Luke or any of the ranch hands cry, so I peeked through a crack and moved some hay to see better. He was brushing his horse down and said he sure did miss Luke and Emma, and he was lonely as a polecat. Mama, she asked and stopped with a puzzled look. Where did Emma go that he missed her? I see her every day. She looked at the door that pointed towards Emma's table next door. About the same time, Emma came through, drying her hands on a towel, then tucking it, tucking it into her apron. Hi, ladies, Emma greeted them. The wood floor squeaked as she walked closer to the two. Reaching into her apron pocket, she pulled out a few oatmeal cookies, still warm from the oven. Emma, have you been somewhere? And we didn't miss you? Maddie quizzed her as she reached up for the cookies. Emma chuckled and looked from Maddie to Liz, handing her a cookie too. No, not that I know of. Just back and forth on that worn path from the front door of the house to the back door of my work kitchen. I don't think I've even visited Dreamland often enough. Maddie listened carefully while munching on her snack. She seemed satisfied for the present and turned back to her practice of numbers. Emma stepped closer to Liz. What's up with Maddie? Seems like a serious conversation you two were involved in. She leaned on Liz's desk and looked down at Liz's book of numbers. Emma, Liz thought that now was a good time to ask about Chet. Are you having any problems with Chet? Maddie seemed to think Chet is sad about you and Luke being away. He misses you both. Emma arched her eyebrows, tilted her head, and did the melee bite the edge of her lip of your lip thing that most of the women did when confused or worried. Well, yes, we had a conversation a few days ago. He had ridden into town at an odd time and found me cooking alone at the restaurant. I didn't know what to think about his visit and thought it best to rest on it a while. I hoped or thought it would ease out. I had no idea he was distraught over it or even dragged it to the next day. I could tell he was all in a frizz about something but I'm still confused about the whole encounter myself. I remember some talk at the quilting, Emma continued. I don't know what got him thinking about us as a couple, you know, more than just good friends and kind of well family. The woman with curly hair and emerald, the woman with curly hair and emerald eyes paused and looked at Liz. Do you or did you think we were a couple? Because he seemed to think everyone did and he felt pressured to stake his claim on me before someone else did. I told him there was no need, as we were just fine. Chet asked if I had a sweetheart at some other ranch or here in town. Emma continued, I replied with a strong and flat no. He then asked, well, do you want to get married? I turned to look at him, and he was now standing in front of me. I said, why would we want to do that? We haven't even kissed. He grabbed me by the shoulders and kissed me. Not much of a kiss, as you would expect, at a proposal, I might add. I must admit that I was slightly bewildered at his actions. I replied, do you want married life with me right now, Chet? He paused and stepped back from me, almost worried of what I would say. Well, no, I don't, do we? He said back to me, and he sounded so confused. I've never seen him without confidence. It's like he was a scolded little boy. Liz covered her mouth, afraid that a giggle might creep out. Don't laugh. He was so serious, Emma added with concern for her friend. I'm sorry. Liz straightened her face. Then what happened? I said, no, I don't want or need to get married. Do you? He blinked and looked at me, and I couldn't tell what he was thinking. 
I don't think he really wanted to get married, do you? She didn't wait for Liz's answer before continuing with her story. Chet, you work at the ranch, and I work in town. We are both happy doing that, aren't we? He mumbled something and walked out the door, just rode away. I think he came into town just to talk with me about this, but our talk only left me more confused. Liz paused for a moment, thinking. Thomas said back months ago, well, when they were hunting for the mountain lion and Lydia was born, that Chet was in a state of confusion with you. Why? Nothing's changed that I know about. We are good friends who enjoy each other's company, with friends and family. We eat, laugh, and talk over life in our town. We are there for each other when we need it. That's not married life. Just as Emma finished the words, she looked at Liz. Oh, Liz, what am I going to do? He does want to get married. I don't think he was, I didn't think he was serious then. When I said no, no wonder he is sad. What pushed him to ask me? And at that point like that, she sank into Liz's desk chair. Thomas said that Chet saw you with someone else on the boardwalk and that you seemed to be real happy to see the other cowboy. Who? Emma asked. Which one? If he only knew how many cowboys or single men in general I talk to each week, if I wanted or needed to get married, I could have a thousand times or more. Poor Chet. What am I going to do now? Liz felt sorry for them both. Not that long ago, she had felt pushed into marriage. It certainly hadn't been without issue either. Being in town at work or on the ranch, both in a week's time, was not easy to manage. Finally, she and Thomas had found a way to make their working relationship function. But now with Megan's not working and being a full-time mom, the situation had become more difficult again. There just isn't enough of me in a day to make everyone happy, Liz sighed over the conundrum she faced in her own life. Chapter 22, August 1860. Tex was finally back in Fort Worth with news from the Capitol, and he requested Samuel to call a town meeting of the men on the following Saturday afternoon. As word spread over the following week, the anxiety levels grew among the men and women of the county. This political tension is about to get the best of me, Abby stated. Samuel has been wound tight as a new pocket watch all summer. With that day now upon them, the women had gathered in the mercantile where they could see Samuel's office. With the heat of the day, the doors were open, and hopefully some of the voices and statements could be heard clearly as they floated in. The women knew, all, as well as the men, what was at stake with this election. It would be the pivotal point on the southern states succeeding from the Union. They were proud and determined to be able to keep the right of the state to choose and make decisions for their own state's good. No president, Congress, or for the good of the Union would be the final word. Can you tell us anything about what Samuel or Tex knows? Katie Longmont asked. Because of being on the ranch for most of the summer, she had heard very little on the political unrest. Jeremiah had only been making sporadic and hasty trips to town as needed. Most of the ranching or farming families were too busy in the warm months. Crops and animals needed too much tending, but everyone in the nation knew the heat from the capital wasn't all about the weather. Most of the women stood silent or shook their heads. No. One hundred or more men had arrived in town to hear the news. Some paced or visited on the boardwalk of Samuel's office. They were waiting in the street, leaning on or sitting in wagons, and in general, all over the area. Word had spread almost as quickly as a prairie fire that the conventions were over. Candidates had been chosen, and now the battle for votes were beginning. No doubt, this political season had been the most heated that any could remember, but much was at stake, and much was riding on every word that was spoken. Samuel and Tex, along with Jackson, Thomas, and Jeremiah, all came out of Samuel's law office and stepped onto the wood porch in front of the office. The crowd hushed to a silence where a pin could be heard if, if, it, were, if it were dropped. The women hushed each other, straining to hear also. Abby, Liz, and Katie went to stand at the open door of the mercantile just outside on the porch. Men were also standing up and down the boardwalk on the sidewalk 
on the mercantile side of the street. Katie nodded at Liz and motioned for her to look up the street to the other end of town where the saloons and gambling dens had started to pop up. Cowboys and drifters were hurried, coming their way. Liz saw Mr. Barton coming too. For a moment, she wondered how he was getting his whiskey. With so much on her mind, Liz had forgotten about him. He locked eyes with her, but neither smiled in greeting. Right then, Samuel started to speak, and they both looked his way. As we all know, this is an election year, and much is weighing in the balance for our country. Texas spent most of this year in Austin with Governor Sam Houston. Tex stepped forward as his name was mentioned. First, he smiled and looked toward the mercantile where the female population was gathered. The good news is that the first child has been born in the governor's mansion a few days ago. The new baby boy, Temple Houston, and his parents are all doing well. Cheers were heard from the crowd. The women clapped and whispered to each other. Now to the critical news at hand, Tex started again. Governor Houston strongly implores us to keep a cool head make sound decisions as we roll into this election period and not to let our pride run away with us. Texans are fighting men, not afraid to go into the gates of hell. With that said, we are to go about our work and grow our crops and animals and families. Governor Houston does not want Texas to succeed if political tensions rise. He does not want the state to feel pressured to leave the union. He will not vote for the state to succeed. Now Mr. Smith will fill us in on the rest of the political news. The time they all feared had now arrived and the tensions in the crowd was felt by everyone. The reality and seriousness of what Tex had said rolled over in their thoughts. Trying to sort it out, they waited for more news. Let me update you with all the political news and where our nation now sits. In April, the Democrats held a convention in Charleston. The first platform, which was pro-slavery, was rejected in a vote. Eight states walked out, forcing the convention to adjourn. They could not agree on a candidate for the presidential election. The crowd remained silent, allowing Samuel to finish telling all that he knew. The Republicans held their convention in Chicago in May. Lincoln was nominated on the third ballot defeating William Seward. At that time, he stood as a moderate on the issue of slavery. The Republican Party insisted on leaving slavery alone in the states where it already existed, but stood against the spread of it to the new territories and states. We all know the push of territories west will shift the playing field on votes in Congress. The citizens of Fort Worth looked at each other and nodded in agreement. Katie leaned over to Abby. Maybe this isn't as bad as we thought. I hope you're right, Abby sighed, but thought it was wishful thinking on her part. The Democrats reconvened in June in Baltimore and chose Stephen Douglas as the nominee, but the Southern Democrats walked out again, unhappy with the new choice for nominee. Well, they should have, one man in the crowd called out. We all know Lincoln ate Douglas up in those debates in 58, Douglas could not make a decision if his life depended on it. The crowd agreed, unable to hold their silence in agreement any longer. Gentlemen, gentlemen, Samuel raised his hands to calm and quiet the crowd. We now have a Southern Democrat party, and their nominee is John C. Breckinridge. A murmur of approval rippled through the crowd as most liked the man. And not let us forget the Whigs, the old gentleman's party, the Constitutional Unionist, have nominated John Bell. That's no problem, an unnamed man in the crowd yelled out. They are the know-nothing party anyway. Four parties are what we have, with the Democrats splitting, Tex added, stepping up next to Samuel again. He started talking with a loud voice over the noise of the crowd. Lincoln is campaigning in the southern states on a moderate position. He is a respected state politician. Let's give him a chance and see what he says. When he said a house divided against itself cannot stand, he was right. What do we do now? Another man from the crowd asked loudly. We will wait to see what unfolds and do as Governor Houston said. We are to go about our work, grow our crops, 
take care of our families and animals. Remember, Sam Houston wants to stay with the Union. We are Texans first, the same man yelled out, and we are Americans foremost, Samuel firmly said. We Texans are fiercely independent and proud people, and we have poured out our blood creating this state, fighting outlaws and Indians and criminals and governments. Look across our landscape, and you will see the log cabins of Kentucky, Mexican mud and German rock, and wood homes, small southern plantations, or homes from New York and the East. We are pieced together like the quilts our women folk make, each piece intricately placed in a solid unity with each other. We must not let the political uncertainty unravel our seams or tear us apart. Together we will stand as Texans and as Americans. The men nodded their heads and began to talk among themselves. Samuel stepped back, signaling he was done reporting. He turned to Thomas. I guess that went well enough. It was only information, nothing to be decided upon yet. Thomas patted Samuel on the back, reassuring him of a job well done. We have done all we can do for the time at hand. Liz watched the crowd disperse to their wagons and start down the road. The heaviness in her soul couldn't be shaken. In only a matter of time, a decision will have to be made, and the outcome will divide friends, families, and finally a nation. Grandfather was right. The time was now upon them with the presidential election. The summer days passed and fall was upon Fort Worth. The community had their seasonal rituals as their crops that had been planted were now harvested. Women canned their gardens produced for provision during the winter and the early spring months. People came and went in the mercantile and through town. A wagon train stopped for a few days as repairs were made. The men traded political news and the women tried not to worry over what they were not supposed to hear or understand but the dividing of the Union was on everyone's mind. Some joined the wagon train to travel farther west to get away, while others simply hid their head in the sand as they had for years, ignoring what wasn't on their doorstep. Before long, Thomas walked into the mercantile with Liz and Maddie. As soon as he sat down at the back of the store where she played and ran her part of the general store, Maddie jumped on his lap. Daddy, I missed you. Maddie hugged his neck and both of her arms squeezed him tight. Then he, then she placed a kiss on his clean-shaven cheek. When Liz finally had a moment, when the store was free of customers, she stood leaning against the counter watching father and daughter interact. Thomas was so good with his little girls. She knew he missed them because he had been staying in town more since the birth of Lydia. Life was good when it revolved around the time Daddy would get home. I've missed you too, little one. Thomas hugged her tightly. I have good news for you, Maddie. Maddie leaned back on his lap and placed her hands on each side of his face, commanding his full attention. What, Papa, what? She squealed as she looked into his face. Thomas looked at Liz, drawing her into the conversation. Liz was now inquisitive about what the good news could possibly be. She certainly needed some. She smiled, continuing to watch the two. Maddie, your prayers have been answered. Against all odds, your Callie cat is going to be just fine. Without one of her ears, she healed up pretty quickly with Lulu's doctoring, and the really great news is that she is past the quarantine time of rabies. We will let her loose on the ranch when I get home. Oh, Daddy, she squealed again and jumped down to dance and hop in excitement. Can I see her when I get home? She clapped in delight. Yes, sweetheart, you can. You must have prayed real hard because Callie should have died in the attack or contracted the disease. Liz smiled. She prayed every day and often. Maddie is a good little prayer warrior. Thank you, Thomas, for giving the cat a chance and not putting it down right away. I am sure Lulu did a wonderful job of nursing her back to hell. She did, he chuckled. I checked the cat twice a day at any sign of rabies I was going to put her down. Probably really shouldn't have taken a chance, he paused. If the girls had, had been around the ranch, I wouldn't have, Thomas said seriously, and then chuckled once again. I think nursing the cat gave Lulu something to dote on with you and the girls gone. Liz moved closer as Thomas stood and reached out to draw her into his embrace. Sure has been quiet with all my girls gone, 
I've missed you. Me too. I've missed you so much. Liz kissed him. We will try to get a schedule and some more help now that Megan and Lydia are out of the woods and completely healthy again. Just a weekend or an overnight is not enough for me, Thomas, Liz sighed, looking at her handsome, understanding husband. I agree. He kissed her again and held her close. Maddie and I are going over to the house to see Sophie and the others. You about to close up? Yes, Liz answered as she considered her work. I won't be but a few minutes. Tell Megan we can start supper. Maddie waited patiently at the back door of the mercantile for her papa to take her hand. Okay, Thomas said as he took Maddie's little hand. Abby and Samuel are coming over too. Jeremiah and his family are eating at the Parkers tonight. As father and daughter headed down the steps, Maddie said, You love Mama. I'm glad you love her. They paused a moment as he bent down to acknowledge her words at her eye level. Yes, I do, Thomas said, wondering where her thoughts were going. You girls and your mother are my family, and I missed you. Chet misses Emma, too, Maddie stated firmly. But Emma doesn't love Chet, and he's sad. I'm glad you aren't sad, Papa. Thomas listened to his little girl's grown-up thoughts. She heard and listened to everything around her. I'm sorry Chet and Miss Emma are having problems of some kind. Now that Callie is well, let's pray for Chet and Miss Emma. But Papa, she replied seriously, God has time for all of our prayers. She emphasized all with her face and hands. Thomas smiled at the wisdom of his little daughter. Yes, he does, Maddie. You are so smart to know that. He stood as Maddie pulled his hand, skipping to the steps of the porch. Daily, daily life continued as November voting date drew closer. Every newspaper that came into the mercantile was read from cover to cover by every man and woman, gleaming every bit of information they could and hanging on every word. Liz and her family were happy as life settled down after their excitement of new babies, animal attacks, and the community prairie fires. Life was returning to their normal days of enjoying family and working together. With the help of a few others, Samuel and Tex built a sheriff's office and jail located on the same side of the street as the law office, but away from the mercantile, the church, and the school. Jackson had finally accepted the job of town sheriff. He spent most of his time over the rise where the gambling halls had been built and where the cattle driving cowboys taking the Chisholm Trail stopped to rest their cattle and wet their whistle. Some of the cowboys would mosey down the street to miss to the mercantile for a bar of Maley soap or for a good meal at Emma's table. Some of the drunken, unruly cowboys would spend the night in the jail with Emma delivering breakfast to the now sober and passive occupants. Emma pretty much knew everything that was happening in town from the law office, the jail occupants, the patrons of her, the gambling halls, the cowboys, and the general store customers. She wasn't a gossip, though, refusing to share all she knew with any who would listen. Town was full again on Election Day in November. The news of Lincoln's victory wasn't long in coming. The winded pony stopped abruptly in front of the Pony Express station house. Luke waited for the rider to jump off so he could grab the mochilla with the letters and newspapers which announced Abraham Lincoln was now the new president of the Union. Did you hear? The rider called out as he approached Luke and jumped from the tired horse. No, Luke quickly replied. He tossed the mochilla into place over the fresh horse. Luke vaulted onto the back of the black horse as the rider exclaimed, Pass the word. Lincoln's our new president. The letters and articles are in your mochilla. Luke snapped the reins over the horse and was off at full speed in less than two minutes from the other's other riders arrival suddenly he was struck with the realization of exactly what he was carrying across country to the west he carried not just any newspaper or letters from home but the official news of the united states government and the announcement of the victor of the presidential race luke's heart beat faster and the pounding hoofs stirred up the trail dust as he pushed the pony harder each rider did his best over the 2,000-mile trail to announce the election results in the fastest time. A new record was set, only six days to tell the West who their new leader would be. 
Chapter 23, December, 1860. Any news? Thomas asked as the men assembled after church. Being at the ranch most of the time, and with Jackson in town all of the time, Thomas felt out of the loop on the most current news. Liz filled them in on what the newspapers reported, and then he would read them cover to cover. Still, he knew Samuel was a wealth of up-to-date Texas news, which greatly concerned him. Samuel added another log to the fire as the day was cold and dreary. His friends, usually Jackson, Jeremiah, and Pastor Parker, liked to sit around to talk in the living room above the law office. Today, though, Parker was home with his wife and new baby. The community considered this group of five to possess wisdom, cool tempers, and good decision-making skills to lead the community. Anytime Tex was in town, he joined the group as well as he usually had the most current news from the Capitol. Samuel sat back down and picked up his coffee cup. I just learned from Tex earlier this week that Indian raids are on the rise and trying to move them to the designated Indian territory north of us has presented problems. Some resent the western progression of the settlers, ranchers, and wagon trains. Well, if we don't worry over our own government unrest, we can worry about the Indian raids on our ranches. I almost forgot about them with the South in it, upheaval. Jeremiah leaned forward and rubbed his hands together in front of the fire, which had started to come to life from the additional logs. Thomas chuckled at Jeremiah's sentiment, but he only said what everyone else was thinking. What else, Samuel? Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Lee and four companies of the 2nd Cavalry have been deployed way south at Brownsville to end the cross-border raids by Texas and Mexicans. It never ends, does it, Thomas sighed. No, Jackson agreed, but it has given me my life's work. I rode with Lee for a while till I was assigned to meet a group of wagons on the East Tex border. That's where we met the Maley women and brought them on to Fort Worth. My work is to no liking of Megan, I might say. Jackson noted a few Texas Rangers have gone with Sully Ross and a detachment of the 2nd Cavalry to the Peace River not too far from here. Yeah, they were asking for volunteers to go with them, Thomas said. They came by the ranch, but we had no warm bodies to give, and we were down to the bone. I can't get a full day's work out of Chet. Thomas joked at the last statement as everyone knew that Chet and Emma were on the outs, but no one understood why. Chet didn't go into town much and seemed quite content to take any extra shifts at the ranch. The door burst open downstairs, and Tex and Pastor Parker took the staircase two at a time. They burst into the room with a barrage of energy and out of breath. I rode ahead to tell Parker the old ranger was out of breath and took a moment to recover. He looked over the men, mentally taking note of who was gathered in the room. Parker stepped closer to the fire and brushed a few raindrops from his hat. Tell him, Tex. I was riding with the group that went out to the Peace River to look for the Comanche. We had a fairly peaceful raid as raids go, and we found a blue-eyed squaw. We thought something was amiss and tried to figure out what it was. We tried to get her to speak English, but she acted like she didn't know any, speaking only Comanche and looking like an Indian, I might say. Anyway, we brought them in, her and her baby girl named Prairie Flower. She also has an older son named Quana. They are holding her at Birdville. Colt is handling some of the things, trying to notify as many families as possible. I came here to tell Parker that Cynthia Ann has been found alive and married to the chief's son, Nakona. She has several children. Twenty-six years have passed since that little girl was captured at the Parker Fort on the Navasota River. The men stood silent, all astounded by the news. Just wait till the women hear about this, Jackson exclaimed. Lincoln is a known opponent to slavery, and neither does he want war, Liz said to the gathering of ladies at the quilting frame. She pulled her needle and thread through the patch to quilt it and stopped. The South Carolina legislator perceives Lincoln and his conviction on slavery as a threat. They are calling a state meeting to vote to succeed from the Union right now. The ink wasn't even dry on the ballots when they started making plans, Katie said with disapproval. Even with Governor Pickens said they would go before the election, its third richest in the Union 
The state representatives felt they had a lot of political power. Jeremiah was quite upset, knowing a domino fall would come next. Only more will follow, putting more pressure on Texas to succeed. The Hill Country Group is the only area that wants to stay with the Union. In that case, the Texas vote will go for succeeding and joining the Confederacy of the Southern States. Liz voiced her thoughts, still not stitching along the marked steam line. The rain tapped on the window. It was the only noise in the room after Liz had spoken. It was a Sunday afternoon, and word had spread quickly at church that things were coming to a volatile point. What other states will follow South Carolina and join the Confederacy, asked Little Dove, as she wasn't as knowledgeable on the state's affiliations as were the other women. Megan spoke first. I feel relatively sure our Louisiana and Mississippi will succeed as well, both being slave states. Alabama, Florida, and Georgia will come along too. They all want the right, as a state, to make decisions for their state. The room remained quiet for a few minutes as each quilter was lost in her own thoughts and concerns. Liz went back to the needle and loaded stitches on it with the up and down rocking of the needle. Each time she pushed the needle down, her fingers underneath the quilt felt it, and she tipped the needle back up through the layers of cotton. When the process was repeated several times with the rocking motion of the needle, more stitches were placed on the needle. Then she pulled all of the needle and thread taut in the fabric and started all over again. Twelve stitches per inch was excellent, and everyone present could do the expected twelve. I miss Anna. Wish she and her baby, Aubrey Faith, could come today, Katie said. If the rain and cold weather wasn't here, I'm sure she would have felt up to it. Both of them are getting along quite well. I was hoping to hold and spoil that little bundle of joy. I just love the smell of a new baby, sighed Megan. So pure and sweet, innocent and untouched. As far as I know, Emma added, they had an easy time and Anna did quite well. Little Aubrey came fast. Without saying a word, each female knew that a live, healthy baby was a gift for any of them, but especially for Anna Parker. I'm so happy for her, Abby added to everyone's sentiments. Little Dove was quilting away, simply listening and learning. She didn't have the maturity of the other quilters as of yet, but she was accepted among them as an adult woman. Her own experience had taught her well at a young age. Yes, her water broke and her labor started, and within an hour she had our baby. Hope Rose is just a sweet, good big sister, and Parker won't leave her side. He insisted on staying with her today and pushed me with my cape and hood right out the door in the rain. Wasn't she born after midnight on Tuesday a week ago? Barely making it into December, Katie asked, not sure she knew all of the details of Anna's story. Yes, Little Dove replied in a pleased voice. Her Indian accent wasn't as apparent as it had been from years ago. The baby came so fast we didn't have time to call anyone for help. For all of the hardship she has had, this birth was very simple and easy. Well, she deserved one and had put her time in for sure, Katie replied to Little Dove. All of the women had been over at some time during the week to see Anna and her baby and offer any help they could. But with Little Dove right there, there wasn't much needed. The cold and wet weather had kept many away from town for the weekend, so not much news was circulating. Things were fairly quiet except for the lingering thoughts on the splitting of a nation. And what could develop? The women all, the women had all steered clear of talking about it that day, but the apprehension weighed heavily upon each of them. So that will end our story hour today, and we'll start tomorrow right in on chapter 24 on page 167. So I think, uh, and from your comments and from the emails we get that you guys are really enjoying the story of the Maley women, and what a volatile time in the lives of our country and our families at that time. Um, it really is amazing how they could get through all of the hardship that they had and just how things kind of piled upon uh, one um, and the other. And, of, of course, getting together for a quilting where they could all talk and enjoy each other's company was something that they all looked forward to and was very much a social time. I hope you've enjoyed our story time today, and we'll see you tomorrow.